Uh, what I'm going to say is going to overlap, but uh, minimally, with what uh, Hervé said uh, earlier today. And uh, I'm going to talk about water. I think an interesting part of the story in, in the end will bring, uh, in a, I hope, a new perspective on uh, uh, how water contributed to the origin of life. Because you have this uh, motto as uh, uh, Christine said yesterday, NASA motto is uh, go after water. And I think uh, it's everybody says the same thing. I think everybody is saying the same nonsense because water is not enough to create life. And we'll see all the, the we see some of the conditions we need to get life which go well beyond water. So traditionally there are two schools, two schools of thought with the origin of water in, in the earth. The first one led by, uh, uh, by petrologists and uh, geochemists. I would mention Harrison Brown, who was a great uh, figure, never got a Nobel Prize, but a very significant physicist uh, from Caltech in the late 40s who said, well, we can see that water is coming out from the uh, fr uh, water and other gases are coming from volcanic eruptions. And so it makes sense to assume that water is actually uh, being outgassed from the deep mantle and from the, uh, from the shallow mantle. And we have uh, all the oceans and all the atmosphere made by that kind of uh, volcanic event. And we can see it, it's just like, uh, you know, but it's about the same thing. Uh, as uh, saying, well, I can see that the sun is, rota is revolving around the earth because in the morning is here, in the afternoon is there. It's the same story. I can see it. I can prove it. Okay, it's the same kind of uh, same level of argument here, and uh, we can see that water goes back into the mantle. Here is uh, what is a technique. Is a seismological technique called, uh, I mean, re relying on dissipation here. The fact that uh, uh, the mantle is uh, soft, or not, it's not it's a uh, soft, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it uh, dissipates uh, more energy uh, in, in under the condition uh, it is uh, uh, under the condition it can be deformed, and you can see here in general you can assign. Uh, this, uh, the, the, the strength of dissipation, of energy dissip uh, dissipation, uh, the seismic energy, to the fact that there is water above subduction zone. And here, what you can see is that you have a subduction zone here, it's a cross section here between Europe and, and, uh, and Americas, and the Americas. And here you can see that there is that zone which is kind of softer because there is water going into, and water is, is actually exhaled from the subducting plate. And you can see that what is actually making a cycle, not only it goes out of the mantle, but, but also it goes back into the mantle and we don't know where we stand within the cycle. Uh, is the cycle some kind of steady state or is, are we still outgassing primordial water? This is a very difficult problem. Uh, so there is another uh, kind of, another school which has been uh, which is much earlier, it's 19, uh, I would say 1995. You know, the astronomers, they never, they never look at their feet, they always look at the sky, okay? And uh, when you ask an astronomer where he or she thinks that water comes from, it tells you it comes from the sky, everything comes from the sky. Um, and uh, so that's an idea and Tom Owens in, the, in 1995 actually made the assumption that all the water was brought, had been brought to the earth by comets. As one of the journalists said one day, is uh, water is extraterrestrial. Uh, 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 this is a wonderful uh, way of saying things. Okay, it's by comets, and another good idea is by chondrites, especially carbonaceous chondrites. Some, uh, if you look at some of the carbonaceous chondrites, like the famous Orgueil, uh, it's French. Uh, <laughs> Um, contains up to 20% H2O, so that's a lot of that's a, that's a lot of water. And uh, so it can that's the alternative view 
of water and uh, how is it important? It's important because it changes the, the entire dynamics of planetary objects. Water, at least you can give it water, that aspect, that, that, per, per, that property that it changes entirely the dynamic behavior of the different planets. I don't know about life. It, uh, uh, water reduces the uh, mental viscosity, makes it softer, easier to move around. And uh, when you plot things here, you have the strain rate and you have the stress. And in order to get, reach a particular strain rate here, uh, adding water helps. Oh, I'm sorry, it's in French. It's dry and wet. Okay, uh, so adding water actually reduces the amount of strain you have to impose on a particular solid to deform it to a given rate. So it makes it softer. It changes the viscosity. And uh, also changes an important property, which is called the tensile strength, how much you have to pull on an object to break it. Okay? Some objects are extremely resistant. If you take a, 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 a piece of cloth, it will be extremely hard to, to pull it apart. If you take a piece of glass, the glass is extremely fragile. The, the tensile st the strength is very low. So what you have here is two types of uh, tectonics associated with the amount of water. And uh, the best uh, contrasting examples, this is from Paul Tackley here, is the Earth versus, the, the, the versus Mars. Mars is supposed to be much drier than the Earth. We can talk about it if you like it. I know that there is some water, but there's so little water on Mars that it makes a huge difference here. So the Earth is wet, it's all wet. So we have this kind of regime here, tectonic regime, which is plate called plate tectonics. And in contrast here, if you have the dry mantle, we cannot easily bend the plates. If there were any plates on Mars, cannot bend them. They don't break easily. So it, um, that makes us something much more rigid. And we get what we call a stag stagnant lid re uh, regime here and different convection patterns here. So uh, that's what it does to the, to the mantle here. Water changes the mantle rheology and the metal of mantle convection. Plate tectonics is effective at removing heat from the core. We're going to talk about this. So this is, uh, this is the earth here. So when plates cool down, they're heavy and they bend, and subduction begins. When the lithosphere is rigid and the viscosity is high, what you get is uh, some thick blanket at the top. It's, this is what a regime of what we call the stagnant lid here. And if there is mental convection, and I think there is mental convection, I'm not the only one on Mars, but mental convection must take care underneath that stagnant lead. And what you see here is that extracting heat uh, from the bottom of the mantle is much easier uh, with the plate tectonics because uh, you have uh, uh, hot material being erupted at the surface. That's what you have with mid-ocean ridges. So actually pulling out uh, heat from the, uh, from the bottom of the mantle and that allows the, the mantle to cool down much more easily than in this case here. And that's, that's extremely important because, as you know, the dynamo is a heat engine. We, have, uh, we, produce, we introduce uh, some energy in the form of radioactive decay of potassium in, in the core. So we make the core move around and triggers the dynamo effect. And, but then you have to get rid of the excess heat produced during the, pro the, during the, the process. Is this a Carnot cycle or is this a heat engine? So here you can actually remove the, something like a 10 megawatts of uh, 10 terawatts of, uh, of energy here. In this case, it's much more difficult to remove the excess heat, and actually the dynamo chokes under its own its own uh, its own heat, and the dynamo stops. That's why that's probably why we don't have a dynamo on Mars. Okay, maybe why we don't have one on Venus either. Okay, so that's, uh, that makes uh, something extremely important. So we, if we have a plate tectonics, uh, we have uh, continents and ocean. And that's very important. Water makes the buoyant granitic continents. continents. Uh, granites are something 
This is not a primary material from the mantle. You cannot make a granite out of the mantle. Why? Because if you melt granite and you put it back into the mantle, it reacts. So you cannot have a, a hydrochloric and, and a caustic soda being from the same area because you put them back, they react. It's the same thing with granite and a mantle material. So we need a two-stage process by extracting basalt and remelting or devolatilizing or whatever you want to produce granites. And that makes a buoyant, buoyant continent with a kind of a cork. And that cork, if it's uh, thick enough, it will rise above sea level. That's what Hervé was uh, alluding to earlier on today. And you have, you can tell, uh, this is probably Google Earth, you can see the, the continents here rising well above abyssal plains. And you have this dichotomy, which is absolutely characteristic of the Earth and which for me is the condition for the, 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 the appearance of life on any planet. If you don't have a plate tectonics, I claim that you cannot have life. And this is why I'm so sorry, so, so worried about Europa. And I'm so sorry about, uh, I'm, I'm worried about uh, Ganymedes and all these places because we don't have a plate tectonics. You know, we'll see. Gro granites can be formed in the mantle. And we have this, uh, uh, this continent ocean dichotomy, which you can see from space. You can see it from a plane, but you can, because you can see, you can see the different colors, but you can see it's from space. So now let's take a problems, a few problems one at a time. Uh, the first problem I'm going to deal with is the planetary compositions. How do, do we know the composition of the Earth, the Moon? The Moon is extremely important because it's related in its genetic aspects to the, to the origin of the Earth. And we're going to try to understand how planets form. We have a planetary cookbook, okay? And we're going to start with the solar nebula. Laplace, you know, was... He was probably not the first one exactly, but he's the one who formulated uh, clearly the physics of the solar nebula. And what you have here is material. That material here is uh, probably inherited, as uh, we heard yesterday, from uh, uh, maybe from uh, filaments uh, expelled by a centotic giant branch. Uh, uh, um, the red stars and things like this, and you have uh, some uh, a cloud of molecules and dust, because we have a pre-solar dust, we know that, and that material actually contains a lot of elements, but also contain a lot of angular momentum. That's why everything spins, okay? We have angular momentum, so angular momentum has to be preserved, and the only way uh, Material can condense is by sedimenting, by sedimenting in a parallel to the axis, the main axis of rotation here. So with material falling down onto the mid plane here. I'm sorry for the French that wasn't in, in here. And you have a, a, a material actually sedimenting here because it doesn't change the angular momentum of the whole system. So we end up having a, a disk, which is going to call which we're going to call the nebula disk. And then in the, in the center, we have the star. And the star is formed, well, that's what it was the standard model says, because of material, because of exchange of angular momentum between the different moments, is something spread, because it's, a, it's a viscous, OK? It spreads out outwards. So when it spreads, it cools down. And some of the material, because angular momentum has been conserved, goes into the star and just accumulates into the star. Uh, so the composition of the solar photosphere, which is almost exactly the composition of carbonaceous chondrite minus, uh, minus eight and 98%, which is hydrogen and helium. If you remove hydrogen and helium, there is something left, not much. But it's called, this is a solid material. This is what people call uh, metal, metallicity. Okay? That's metallicity, that's for astronomers. So you have a hydrogen, helium, and then you have all these elements. Carbon, nitrogen, iron, magnesium, silicon, aluminum, calcium, etc. 
this is what you have. You start your your journey with a, a cloud containing metals, uh, in a sense. And then this uh, uh, this material is hot. Why is it hot? Because it actually falls down, falls down under, and uh, and and uh, and also the the planet is the the the, the star is also sending a lot of radiation. So we have the star forming and sits in contracting. You convert uh, gravitational energy into kinetic energy. And kinetic energy is temperature. Temperature means radiation. And we can heat the whole thing. But at the same time, away from the star, material expands. So it cools down when it expands. So you have a condensation, and uh, we can assume for the solar nebula that we have that kind of condensation, and the fraction condensed, the fraction of condensable material condenses here. So you have a story of cooling here. We have a very high, very, very refractory material condensing here in the beginning between 14 and 1700 K. It's not very hot. And then it goes down here, and then the condensation stops, and then starts condensing again. And we start producing the most important part of the planet, which is the mantle and the core. So we have iron, magnesium, calcium, aluminum, and all that stuff, which is surprising. Condenses in 150 degrees around uh, 1200, 1300 K here. And it stops again here. Can you see the rate of condensation here? Now the rate of condensation, the, the, the fraction contents is actually the slope here. Okay, and then it stops, and then you have some uh, le uh, less condensable elements that we're going to call volatiles. And you have elements that are more or less volatile. You have sulfides, you have Kali elements, you have, a, and then in the end, you're going to have a carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen. Hydrogen, sometimes I'm tempted to say that water is the element with this hydrogen, actually. You have these things here. And you have this condensation here, and you start forming dust and gravels and things like this. I'm not going to argue about the mode of uh, planetary formation because it's beyond the scope of that talk. And what we can see is that elements actually, elements condense one after another. And they condense over a very narrow temperature interval, which in general is in the order of 50 degrees. But for some elements, electronic properties, potassium, sodium, and other elements, or ytterbium, you might have up to 150 degrees. And if you follow here, there's a fraction condensed. Be careful, it's a log scale, 100%. There is no zero in the log scale. So this is one per meal here, temperature. And you see that condensation is extremely brutal for every element. So you're not going to say that one element starts condensing at 1400 K and keeps condensing down to 200 K. No, no, it doesn't exist. If it starts condensing at 400 K, for him, for, for it, for this element, at 1300 K, the party is over, okay? It's already in the solid. It's not something that you can do. You can oh, move around the elements of the various condensation temperature here. So uh, one number, a number which is extremely important is the 50% condensation temperature here, which has been used a lot since 1967, I think, by Larimer. And now we have a very popular t condensation temperature scale of uh, cutty loaders here. And you see these elements with different 50% condensation temperature with refractory elements among the lithophile elements. And here you have the very volatile elements and some what we call atmophile, 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 I don't know how you say, elements like a nitrogen, like uh, like uh, argon, like uh, the, the rare gases here, oxygen, carbon. These elements are condensed at a very, very low temperature. Water condensed, and hydrogen condensed between 200 and, and 300 K, whereas this guy condensed at 1400 K. Okay, that's a huge difference. So what we see is the temperature, the condensation temperature of these elements from the solar nebula here 
is that first you have a, all the refractory elements. There is some kind of a gap here at 1200K, which corresponds to what actually the, <coughs> the gap that the, 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 the Earth probably experienced. And then you have alkali and high temperature calcophile element. Calcophile elements literally means I love copper, but actually it meant, you know, it's just like a, a immense I love sulfur. Okay. Don't ask me why. This is just a historical thing. Okay. And uh, you can see here that uh, you have a, a number of gaps here. You have a low temperature uh, calcophile elements, and you're going to find sulfur in there. Okay. The question is. Uh, the earth has very little uh, zinc or copper or things like this. How could it get sulfur? Because there is no sulfur. Sulfur hasn't been thinking of condensing when the earth has uh, stopped producing elements, uh, producing, uh, condensing uh, more refractory elements. And volatiles are here. Water is here. So if condensation stops somewhere here or here, there is no way that you can have these elements present in your solid because you haven't thought about condensing yet. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very serious issue here. So the idea is that now, something I remember from last year, is that you cannot consider water as a special thing. You know, it's special, especially because it has a low molecular weight but otherwise, oh, he has a nice, uh, cute uh, hydrogen bond, and things like this. That's fine. But uh, water is made of hydrogen, which is an element like many others. It has its, uh, its own properties, but it's not that special after all. And you can see, for instance, here, this is a nice correlation between water. I divide it by calcium because the calcium is a refractory element. And if you, the, the idea is that if you remove 20% of volatile elements, everybody else will be increased by 20%. It's just a mass, it's a normalization thing. Okay? So I divided both by calcium, I could have taken magnesium, whatever refractory element. But you can see that uh, water and, and zinc are strongly correlated in meteorites. So you cannot say, oh, I put water here, I put zinc there. No, 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 that doesn't work. That doesn't work. You cannot separate these guys very easily. All the planetary objects we have, the, the chondrites here, ordinary chondrites, CI, CO, whatever, and you have the planets here, that's ordinary chondrites, and the planets are here. So, well, I would say water may be something special, but no, carbon is the same. You could have nitrogen, it would be the same. You could have a chlorine, it would be the same. All these elements, they travel together. They are a big family, by a big family of volatile elements. So, so what does it mean? It means that we have now a solar nebula with the sun. The sun irradiates energy. The sun, the, the sun is actually uh, collapsing on itself. Yeah, it may not have a, started a, a nuclear reaction yet, but converting gravitational energy into kinetic energy, it means in temperature, will let the sun irradiate light, uh, then infrared or whatever, UVs, and uh, maybe X-ray, and some stars go to uh, gamma rays and things like this. And if you want to understand what the, the temperature distribution in the solar nebula here, you have to think of yourself being in your bathroom, and after a shower, you turn on the radiator on that because you're cold, okay? And that's exactly the same procedure here. You have the same, assuming that the solar nebula is transparent, because if there is, trans if there is opacity, it's a slightly different. But the amount of energy crossing the red sphere here is the same amount of energy crossing the blue sphere here. But the amount of energy per uh, square surface area, by, by per surface area, will be very different. If you go to Titan, for instance, you're going to have a 11 times less luminosity as you have on Earth. So uh, this is uh, what uh, this is a very important the total power crossing each, uh, cr crossing each surface. The surface, uh, whatever is, uh, you understand what I mean, okay? So. 
uh, here is the star when it when the, at the beginning of everything. It's uh, six thousand years ago, uh, <clears throat> and then you have a, you have a star here, and here we have the the sun, which hasn't started its uh, nuclear reactions yet, but it has a cloud of molecular gases and dust around here, and there is light emitted. These are ambipolar, the ambipolar jets here, which we get rid of most of the angular momentum of the solar system. But here there is absorption of light by dust, and it's re-emitted in the infrared. It's a, it's a greenhouse effect, but on a, on, a, on a solar scale here. And this is what you see, this is what you call a titari it's a Titari star, and you see this uh, black uh, disk around the star, and this uh, disk of dust and, and uh, material will be progressively removed. It will be blown off by the star, by the light. The light coming out, coming out of the star will actually push away the, the gas, push away all the dust, and it will be le we will be left with the rocky disk. But most of the gas at some point, most of the dust is gone. And uh, if the planets are not finished, too bad. Okay, we haven't finished condensing. Wait a minute. No, 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 it doesn't work that way. Uh, the, the star is still uh, tr uh, trying to get rid of all the, all the molecule cloud and all the dust, and the planets are unfinished. So we have, and uh, how, how long does it take? It takes about, this is the proportion of disk, of titari disk, that still have a disk after a given time. So after five million years, you can see that 95% of the titari stars already lost their molecular and dust disk. So it takes, that's the same thing that didn't exist when I was young. I have been young too, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember, but it's too far. <laughs> but uh, we, we, for us, uh, making a planet would, could take uh, 50 million years, 100 million years. We wouldn't care. It was okay. But it's not okay. It, uh, everything, party is over in 5 million years, 3 million years. So it means that actually Jupiter must have been down in a few million years, or one million years, two million years, Saturn, and all these things. Otherwise, the, all the gas would have been blown off. Okay, so it goes extremely fast. So that's uh, where we come to the concept of the uh, of the snow line. Okay, at some point we far away from the star. When we far away, it's cold. When it's cold, water condenses. It condenses as ice. Okay? It doesn't condense as liquid water, it condenses as ice. When we are in the inner solar system, there is no, no water condensation. So material that, that has formed, like the Earth, like Mars, like Venus, okay, have very little, very little water, very little, very little volatile elements. So we have the giant, the, the, the giant planets here, and we have and this uh, snow line, which is about uh, between Mars and Jupiter, is the place where we start having condensation of uh, of, of of ice. Okay. Okay. Now we gonna I'm gonna show you how we determine the composition of planet. I'm gonna take the example of the Moon. How do we know the composition of the Moon? A good idea. Okay, you send a few guys up there, grab a few samples, and then you get some basalts. That's what you get. You don't get pieces of lunar mantle, you don't get sediments, you don't get, but you get a few basalts here and breaches, impact breaches. And then you go back home and you say, well, what's the composition of the moon? Oh, I got some basalt, that's all I get. Okay, we have to find the technique, and uh, the technique is relatively simple as the composition. The, the thing we know is that all these planets are depleted in volatile elements. The question is whether they were born depleted or whether the volatile element had been lost afterwards. I mean, the school of thought 
uh, when I started working on this problem, maybe 90, 95% of the community, or well, 98% of the community, thought that planetary bodies had lost their volatiles. And actually, evidence is very strong that they didn't lose volatiles, they never had them in the first place. So we have here a, a standard plot here, Earth, the composition of the Earth, I'm going to show you how to get there, divided by chondrites, we could divide it by the solar photosphere, it wouldn't make much difference. Normalized for uh, the loss of uh, elements by making magnesium equal to 1, and this is the condensation temperature. And you see that there is a relatively regular decrease here and we missing a lot of volatile elements. So volatile elements is H2O, lead, zinc, cesium, indium, uh, <coughs> boron, potassium, sodium and all these elements. We'll come back to this. How do we get to this? Okay, we The enemy is magma. I'm sorry, Harvey. Enemy is magma. Why? Magma is actually pulling out elements. It takes the, the, the what melts first from the mantle, it condenses the good stuff coming out because it melts easily. And uh, you get this and you fractionate, what we call fractionate, the composition of the melt is not the composition of the mantle source. First thing, okay, we extract the basalt, which is the juice of the mantle. It's not the mantle. And then you take that juice and you bring it up uh, like uh, overcooked pizza or whatever, it's uh, things starts uh, doing bad things, and we start precipitating crystals. There's no crystal in pizza, but uh, um, we start precipitating crystals like olivine, like a pyroxene, plagioclase, whatever. And then again, the magma itself is modified. So we have modified modification upon melting we have a modification upon crystallization of the magmas. So it's a mess. How do you want us to know what is inside the Earth after, after all that mess? So the technique is relatively simple, goes back to the, to the early 80s here, and you take some elemental ratios here. Here is cesium rubidium. And you plot it against something, for say, cesium or rubidium. Since this ratio is constant, you can see that it doesn't make much difference. And you see that these elements have the same geochemical behavior. They're not what we call fractionated by magmatic processes. Magmas leave this ratio alone. So there are some magic ratios, uh, like a samarium, hafnium, rubidium, cesium, whatever, potassium, uranium. And, but you have uh, some more interesting uh, elements, some uh, more interesting ratios. Ratios of volatile to refractory elements. These ratios don't change during magmatic processes. But one of the, the blue one here is a volatile element here. So these ones were known, this one we established that a few years ago, and H2O serum is probably the most important. You have volatile elements here, the refractory elements. These ratios are not modified by the composition, by the, by the magmatic process. So we can trust since the refractory elements don't move too much, if we can trust that if we have a magnesium, calcium, whatever, if we have a water, if we have a carbon, if we have anything like this, we can use these, these kind of ratios to establish the composition here. Rubidium, barium. I'm going to show you this. Rubidium, barium versus barium here. So you have the Earth. You can see this ratio is very constant here. And this is the Moon. It does, you don't have to be very smart to conclude that the Moon has much less rubidium than the Earth by more than an order of magnitude and a half. It's huge. Okay? So the Moon is depleted in this alkali element, volatile alkali element called rubidium. The same thing with potassium compared to uranium. Same thing with zinc compared to iron. So we know the depletion extremely well for a number of elements. Okay, and uh, let me skip this. Here I use a, a different scale of energy. If I go back 
to the composition of the Moon and the Earth. This is a kind of uh, distribution of elements. It's the composition of the planets I get by using these magic ratios, but also the combining with other ratios and other type of evidence. Here, what we can see in red, this is the Moon. In blue, this is the Earth. And we see that we have a fairly organized pattern. The Earth is depleted with respect the Earth is depleted, very depleted relatively to chondrite and the average solar system, and the Moon is even more depleted. I can even tell you that if the Moon formed out of a, of a cloud by a giant impact, for instance, made of a terrestrial composition, the temperature would be 4900 K. For those who are familiar with chemistry, this is called a tra Troughton's rule, and this is you can establish the, the you can make sense of this, and you can see that uh, it is an, a very important thing. So now it brings us back to okay, if water wasn't there, where does it come from? Ah, well, you have to find some place where there is water. Where is there water? It's just like the money is in the bank, and water is in the outer solar system. So you have to get there for, to, to get some water. In order to understand that, we use a number of evidence for this. Okay? And probably the most important is the, the DH ratios and to understand where it comes from, the DH Cosmos thermometer. And if you take that exchange between water and deuterium water, okay, this is deuterium, H2O plus HD. This is hydrogen, but with one deuterium. Okay, and uh, this is temperature here, and you realize, you, you calculate the ratio of the DH ratio in, in, uh, in water divided by H, the DH ratio in hydrogen. We have a two carrier of hydrogen, which is hydrogen itself and water. And it all depends on temperature, and here is Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Okay, you see that the more you are into, into the outer solar system, the heavier the material, uh, the heavier the material here. Another effect which is important is the coexistence of uh, two types of hydrogen, what called orthohydrogen and parahydrogen. Because you have two different spins here for the hydrogen, and you cannot go from one to another very easily. It's almost impossible because there's a, there is a forbidden transition here. So you have a parahydrogen and ultrahydrogen here, and you have these two guys, and these two guys have a different isotopic abundances. But all, of course, it's not very important. You have to go very, very, very far, like in, in comets, because here you have the uh, you have to go to 30 or 40 K, at 30 or 40 K there is no isotopic fractionation of hydro, of, uh, uh, and there is no fractionation, no change in the, in the HD ratio here. So if we look at uh, the distribution of the H ratios here, we have uh, what we call the protosolar nebula with Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Maybe this is the sun here. I don't think it, I don't believe it's true anymore, and I'll tell you why. And you have the DH ratio here, and you have the Earth. The Earth has something like 150 ppm deuterium, and uh, we have a number of planets here. We have a chondrite, a chondrite, and the Earth more or less similar, and we have the comets. Uh, up to a few years ago, we thought our oh, comets cannot be the source of water because comets have a very different uh, DH ratio relatively relative to the to the Earth. Okay, the comets are here, and it's a, uh, our, uh, our cloud here. Yeah, but then they found this uh, Jupiter family with uh, Hartley two, and with 45. HMP, whatever, you have some comets that belong to the Jupiter family that look pretty much like what we have on Earth. So uh, pick up your choice, make water from the Earth, you can make it from carbonaceous chondrites or you can make it from this Jupiter family comets. There is nothing at this point against having water coming 
from this area here. Okay, this is a movie by by Sean Raymond, and uh, you see that uh, you you is that uh, something you can do? Whatever is blue is wet. Whatever is is uh, red is dry. Okay, and you let all these asteroids move around. This is eccentricity. This ellipticity, essentially, of the orbit versus the distance to the sun here, and you can see that things. Mix up. This is Jupiter. Jupiter is m making a mess of what's going on here between the Sun and here. It's a three, it's a three uh, body problem here, and you have destabilization. But the point is that we're getting a lot of radial mixing, not 100%. We get some radial mixing in the solar nebula, so we can actually bring some material. It's not forbidden by physics. And we end up, of course, having some planets here with water in the inner solar system here. It's no problem. Okay, can we think of uh, having this uh, whole thing mixing up? And uh, well, that's not that simple. It's not that simple at all because we have oxygen isotopes. And that's something that people do not realize how it's important. Here you have a letter, oxygen isotopes. You heard of oxygen isotopes. There are three isotopes, oxygen 16, oxygen 17, and oxygen 18. Regardless of the process, if you do something wrong with the O18, O16 ratio, it'll be only 50% as wrong on 17 O. 16 because it's half the mass difference. Okay, the effect which is due to mass fractionation, okay, will be twice for uh, 18, 16 compared to 17, 16 because you have two mass difference instead of one. So this is why whatever process all the terrestrial rocks plot on what we call the terrestrial fractionation line, we use a delta, otherwise everybody would understand. Uh, but you use a delta just to tell you it's a relative deviation with respect to a standard that nobody cares about. This is seawater, but seawater is not really relevant here. It's a relative deviation of the abundance of O18 and O17 relative to seawater. This is a deviation, okay? And if you have all the terrestrial fractionation line, I'm talking about tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of samples, they all plot here. The moon plot on the same line, which is actually a good argument to say that in one way or another, either the moon was formed out of the same material as the Earth, or the two things got pretty well mixed up in the end. Okay, one or the other. You, you choose. We haven't resolved that. But the most important thing that we learn first from Marc Chaucidon and Hashizume in Nancy, and uh, on the moon, they took the, the solar wind. You know, what's the composition of the sun? Sending a geologist there, but it's a one way ticket. Uh, so, how do you get the composition of the sun? You can, uh, you can get solar wind. You know, solar particles emitted by the by the sun through the photosphere. And how? What do you measure without having interference with uh, oxygenated material? You go to the moon. You take a pieces of metal released by uh, meteorite impacts. Take metal and you measure oxygen isotopes in the solar wind. That's a cheap way. The more expensive way, you go to Genesis, the, the, the Genesis mission. And you send, you send some stuff at the other end of the solar system and you put some, you know, like flies, you put some glue and you try, to, uh, you try to catch some material that represents solar wind. You have a, you have a dust inter, inter, uh, from, from, from space, but you also have a solar wind. And now we have some incredible meteorites with incredible inclusion that give the same result. The sun is 5% enriched in oxygen 16, but not on the terrestrial fractionation line. 5% oxygen 16 excess. Well, when we find one per meal on Earth, or five per meal, 
we all over the place. We can say a huge fractionation of oxygen isotope. No, 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 it's not a huge fractionation. The sun and the rest of the solar system have very, very different oxygen isotopes, uh, oxygen isotope abundances. And we don't know how to do that. You cannot cook it, you cannot irradiate it, you cannot, there is no process in the solar system that can possibly account for such a huge difference in oxygen isotope composition. The sun cannot be immediately related to the nature of the solar nebula. We don't know how to go from here to here. There is no, uh, there is no known, well, well, there is no process that can take, and we find some calcium aluminum refractory inclusion meteorites actually show this mixing between here and here. So sorry, but the sun is not the solar nebula. There is a huge effect that we don't know how to produce, and I'm going to convince that it's even... So you have a solar wind here, you have a fan inclusions, you have all kinds of things, this is important. Uh, let me let me show you this. So we have a, now that's what I say. The multiple origin of the solar systems are well demonstrated by isotopes. Carbonaceous chondrites can make up to a few percent of rocky material. So we have a different ingredient in the solar system, and clearly the outer solar system has water because it was made out of uh, water-rich material. So if you're not convinced. You look at some other isotopes, isotopes that cannot be suspected to be messed up by anything. We look to neutron-rich isotopes, and historically, this Claude Allegre and, uh, and, and Anne Trinquier, who found it in Paris, you see this uh, chrome 54, this element has an abundance of, which is very particular in chondrites in, and in the other planetary material. You see that there is an excess of chrome 54, which is okay. We know a lot of nucleosynthetic anomalies all over the place. But wow, they correlate with the excess of oxygen 16. Now, you're going to ask me why is it correlated with 17 here? Because the, del the big delta O17 actually is the elevation above this line here, okay, above the terrestrial fractionation line. But it's actually an excess oxygen 17 here. So we have this huge correlation, this very nice correlation that uh, people tried to kill for years and they failed. And this is now absolutely entrenched in literature. You have this correlation between oxygen 16 excess and chrome 54. So we have a number of other isotopes. Actually. We have a titanium 50, another neutron rich element, uh, isotope. We have a, a, a calcium 48. Well, who cares about these small guys? We don't really care. Oh, but let's take a look at. Other more common elements like copper and zinc. This is something we, I did with the Jean-Marc Luc in 2005 for copper and zinc. We also have correlation between zinc isotopes and oxygen 16 excess. Same, same for copper and for zinc. So the, we cannot consider that, that the solar nebula has ever been a homogeneous medium. And how heterogeneous it was, we have no clue so far. So instead of having the standard Laplace solar nebula, we have something like this. With the outer solar system, the inner solar system, the sun, and everybody has a different origin. Uh, now, let's try to do something. Let's try to discuss how we may anyway lose some material. The Iconic uh, image is the giant lunar impact. You have to take a, something looking like Mars and you slam it in the proto Earth. And so pff, yeah, it makes a lot of energy. Energy of the, the average temperature resulting from such an impact is 4000 K. It's pretty hot. So you think, well, it's going to evaporate and we're going to lose the volatile elements anyway. Well, wait a minute. Did you do you think that if you kick a football, you're gonna send it to the moon? I, I know the expression we were looking for: to shoot at the shoot at the moon. If you fail, you land among the stars. Okay, uh, uh, it's 
you're not going to lose because there is some uh, gravity. And uh, what's the minimum thing? So, okay, you kick the ball here, but what does, it, what does it do? It comes back. Or you kick it hard enough that it goes fast enough and then you lose it for good. So it's called the escape velocity. You can calculate the escape velocity for the Earth is 11 kilometers per second, but the Moon is 2 kilometers per second. So this is how it goes. But it's actually not how it goes. We have uh, an atmosphere. The atmosphere is just like we have. We had uh, lots of flying balloon uh, floating about a football field. Okay, it would be it would be fun actually, but uh, there is there's some collisions everywhere. So we have a collisions, and that uh, brings up something we know very well. It's called is thermalized. We have, a, you know, the the the, the mean free path at uh, one pascal, this is, well, uh, we're talking about microns, or so even every fraction of a micron, a molecule actually hits another molecule. So it's thermalized. So we cannot lose the material if bef between the ground and space it has to collide 10 to the 8th or to the 9th time. Okay, it doesn't go away. So we cannot easily lose material because the, the atmosphere is thick. And that's, that's extremely important. And that's temperature dependent, that's a Maxwell distribution. Some of you may be very familiar, calculated for argon. And you see that uh, the velocity in meter per second, this is the fraction of elements that have that particular velocity. And you can see that it's extremely difficult to lose any gas from terrestrial atmosphere. We can lose a bit of uh, hydrogen. We're losing a little bit of helium-3. When it comes to helium-4, it's not really serious. And we come to the rest, we keep it and we keep it our atmosphere. We cannot lose an atmosphere. It's not unless we have a, a, a mean free pass, which is short enough. So an atmosphere looks pretty much like this. You have the base here, which is the most of the troposphere and even more. You have a high pressure, it's thermalized with a Maxwell velocity distribution. Energy gives you is equi equivalent to the temperature and there is no loss. <laughs> Above a certain level, which we call exobase, at the exobase, the average probability of collision is about that height. Okay, uh, we have one chance of a collision when we come to exobase. So if we are above the exobase, very low pressure, no hydrostatic equilibrium, atoms don't talk to each other. You know, at some point, if you or even molecules, they don't talk to each other above the exobase. They don't see each other. We lost in the, we lost somewhere in the in the desert, okay? And you can have a gravitational escape if you go fast enough, if your temper apparent temperature is fast enough that you can escape the velocity field. Yeah, but uh, there is nobody left here. You have your entire freedom because you're in the desert. But it means that the population of the desert, by definition, is not that great. So you don't lose much. That's the problem. And that's what you have here. This is, I tried to make this a very nice uh, movie. I find it very nice because I made it myself. And you see collisions here. And you see material uh, being lost. You see this. Uh, can you see the? No, you don't see them. You see that material being, being left here. So the exobase for a terrestrial atmosphere is 500 to 1,000 kilometers. So you can. We see the exobase here, which is pretty high. You can lose some material, but there isn't much to lose. That's the problem here. So what do we do? We have this impact here. We have the high temperature. And let's try to do a little bit of physics. It's going to be the only time we do some physics here. So this is the normal equation for change of pressure with the elevation above, above the ground. And this is uh, temperature, this thermal agitation here, and this is potential energy. So we have a gravitational, uh, gravitational the, the gravitation here, G. And what counts is, actually because I told you, you must keep 
angular momentum. Everything has to fall down and here, and you only take the vertical component of G. This is what is important. Whatever is goes in that direction violates the change in angular momentum, so we fall down on here. So you calculate GZ, you calculate whatever, and essentially you find very quickly that you have a disk forming that contains all the material. And that's what you have to work with if voltages have to be lost. You lose material from the disk. The thickness of the disk is given by a number of parameters, the mass of the Earth, this is the, this is the orbital frequency here, and you get the, the height of the exobase here, which is HT, and uh, you get the exobase, which is very, very high for the lunar disk. It's several Earth radii. radii. So if you want to lose anything above the lunar, the lunar disk resulting from the impact, you have to go very high, and if you go very high, there is nobody left. So you don't lose much. How do you do this? Okay. So we can cover, calculate the escape probability here. This is oh, this is the the exobase here, distance to the Earth, height z above equator plane, here, and you have the exobase. You have two times the Earth radii, three times the Earth radii here. So you lose material from here. You don't want to do anything with whatever is in there because what you call the Roche, the Roche radius, radius is the radius within which every material is broken down into pieces. Okay, like a Saturn uh, rings. Okay, whatever is inside is broken into piece, interacts and eventually fall down onto the Earth or uh, migrates outside of the Roche radius. You can see that the Maxwell velocity distribution allows you to figure out how much of the material will be lost from that gaseous, that, that gas uh, forming a disk. And you see that with the fraction here, log 10 fraction of uh, atoms having a velocity above the escape velocity. And you see here is a minus 10, minus 8, 10 to minus 10, 10 to minus 8, 10 to minus 6, depending on the temperature. We don't lose much. This is, uh, and uh, having a big collision with a planet like this is not an efficient way of losing, of losing volatile elements. That, 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 that's the story. And it's also very mass dependent here. Atomic mass, 50, atomic mass, 250 here. And you can see this is strongly mass dependent. Uh, another way our impact doesn't do it, uh, I think I changed this, I should uh, revert the, the slides here. It, what tells you that it's not that kind of loss that we're dealing with here is if we consider elements with uh, similar properties like halogens or like alkali elements. You would expect that the lighter the element, the more you lose it. This is not what you see. You see all the alkali elements, they have the same depletion level. Sodium, potassium, cesium, rubidium, they all have the same depletion level. So mass is not relevant. You look at uh, halogens, iodine is, the, is the, the heaviest one. Fluorine is the lightest one. You would expect by any standard that fluorine would have been depleted much more than iodine. So that's the other way around. So losing material by impact is a very, very difficult business. Okay, is there another way of uh, impact itself? Uh, we have uh, something in the protodisc. And what we have here is something Temperature is maintained in the, in the disk by the balance between radiation here and viscous dissipation. You have the disk and everybody rotates around the Earth, but rotates at a different, at a different velocity, so there is friction between the two things. So that produces heat. And how is heat compensated? It's lost by radiation. If you calculate the balance between radiation loss and viscous dis dissipation production, so yeah, you get something like 60,000 K. What actually warms up the disk is not the impact itself, it's the viscous dissipation. 
So, and what's going on? The disk expands, and at some point it expands. We start uh, w wasting material, and we start losing material when the disk expands. But we are not there yet with the loss of volatile elements from planets here. Now, uh, let me remember. Yeah, how do we know the water content of the Earth? I pretend that, okay, uh, common sense tells you one ocean outside, one ocean inside. It's a good rule of thumb. Probably wrong, but it's a good rule of thumb anyway. So, uh, we have water in the ocean, we have a magmatic water, we have geochemical ratios here. A magic properties, we're back to these magic ratios, water serum ratios here. Every magma on Earth, almost every magma on Earth, comes out from the mantle with a water serum ratio of 200. It means that they have more or less the same chemical properties. You can use that to reveal the amount. We, see, we know cerium extremely well, so we know the amount of water in the mantle. Uh, we know that from mineralogy, we know from... So can, can you see these numbers here? So if you compare the different planets, different planetary objects here, chondrites are 300,000. There's a lot of water in chondrites. It's huge. Block silicate earth is two or three hundred. It's uh, three orders of magnitude depleted in water relatively to carbon, relative to carbonaceous chondrites here. Uh, the moon, the moon is 0.3. Uh, you see my extrapolation here. Uh, some exceptions. It's the uh, volcanic plastic glasses here that have a slightly higher value, but actually the moon overall is extremely depleted in water in all the volatiles. The Earth, how do you determine? You go to mid-ocean ridges here, and you have these water cerium ratios I already told you. On the Moon, you have these guys who are actually, that's kind of a, a lava fountains here. This is Iceland here. And you can see more or less this material being equivalent to this, and it has a little bit of water here. Water in melt inclusion, people. But overall, the amount of Moon, this is a water cerium ratio, so it has to be a line here. So you have this uh, pure, what we call pyroclastic glasses. They're rather high in water. They probably have a tenth of 100 ppm of water. But an exception, most of the moon is dry here. Okay, all the old rocks, now we have ABTB comadiites, which uh, contains more water than in ancient, that than modern basalt. Maybe water has been degassed through time. So, uh, the idea is that water was brought by from the outside, you, know, you understand the story now, was brought from the outer solar system by some object. We don't know what this object is. The only way you can do is to take something that will tell you how much meteorite flux you're going to have on the that brings that water to the moon. So we use a concept that uh, people call the late veneer. It's an old, it's a extremely important concept to this guy in 1978. They were still the Apollo days. You take a platinum group element, platinum, osmium, iridium, and all that uh, expensive things that uh, you have around your, your fingers. Uh, and uh, this material, when there is a separation of metal from silicates, all these elements go 99.99% to the core, to the metallic core. So the Earth should be technically totally depleted in what we call platinum group elements, or highly, ref uh, highly cedrophile elements. But actually, the mantle is not. So, someone brought platinum group elements to the terrestrial mantle after cores separated. How can you do that? Where is it? You know the dinosaur, how they die in pain with, the, with all the meteorite coming. Okay, that's the same thing. You have a lot of iridium. And this is how we found. This is the same process. This is exactly the same story. You have a lot of iridium, a lot of osmium, a lot of uh, platinum, whatever, comes into the mantle. And this excess of platinum group element you find in the mantle tells you how much was derived uh, from the late veneer. So uh, the uh, 
common wisdom says is uh, something like a 0.4 percent that makes already a lot of water. PG is in in the, in the in the moon, it's much smaller. It's much smaller, in which is, it doesn't make sense, unless you assume that what brought water to the moon to to the Earth is one particular object that didn't hit the moon. So you can think of having Europa or you having Ganymede hitting the moon, hitting the, the Earth, and not hitting the moon. You can have a little rain of things like no, it doesn't work because the moon would have a lot of water otherwise. So when did it happen? And this is what I call the chaotic first 150 million years that uh, Hervé alluded to earlier on today. My preferred interpretation is this one here. You form the solar system, the Tetari phase. You date the meteorite at 4.568, and then you form the you form the core. And my preferred interpretation, but this is not everybody's preferred interpretation, is that the moon and the core formation were came very early. Some people like to put it much earlier, and that the late veneer came afterwards. Why? Why do I want to have it, the late veneer came in afterwards? Because if the, if the moon was condensed out of wet material, we would find water on the moon in large quantities. And when you look at any rock on the moon, it tells you it's just done dry. It's the bone dry, okay? No way that you can have a lot of water in the moon. You have a little bit in phosphate, but it's just peanuts. You have a, it's essentially dry, okay? And uh, <clears throat> so you can make it older. That uh, my friend uh, Morbidelli and his uh, school like to have it here. It's 0.4 percent. This is the time of giant, a late giant impact. The relative late accretion mass. If we make it 0.4 percent, you get something which is a 70, 80, or 90 million years. But if you're wrong by a factor of two, you can make it at 30 or 40 million years, and you can explain how you can be wrong by a factor of two. So this is not a very strong argument. So we have this very chaotic thing. Okay, you see the lead isotopes, lead isotopes here in basalts, in, in lunar rocks. If you plot this is 207, 204, you make a very nice, fancy uh, geochemical model for the mantle and the crust. You get something like 150 million years. After the formation of the Earth, you have a fractionation of volatile and refractory elements. Uh, I'm going to skip this uh, for lead isotopes. You do it for some uh, uh, extinct radioactivity, iodine and xenon. Okay, iodine and xenon is the same. We're getting the same kind of numbers: 100, 120 million years. Something happened about 100 million years ago, maybe. Some big uh, uh, Jupiter satellite uh, slamming into the into the Earth and bringing its ocean, and bringing its worms, bringing everything it has, and that may be what happened. With this. It's hard to it's hard to tell exactly. Okay, <clears throat> so this is uh, the end of this uh, first part. The second part is going to be much shorter because that's a new part that I promised uh, earlier today. The, earth, the water comes from the outer solar system. Outer solar system and inner solar system are different animals. They don't share the same origin. They don't share the same origin as the sun. We bring some object into the earth. This object has water. Water triggers plate tectonics, which is a, a unique feature of the, in the inner solar system. Plate tectonics does something and that's going to be the history of life. So I'm going to talk now for the rest for the oceanography and the origin of life, which is probably more interesting to you. As I told you, we have this dichotomy. This is a histogram. This is a histogram of elevation, what you call bathymetry. Okay, comparing uh, ipsometry or bathymetry on Earth and Venus, continents and ocean, the hands of plate tectonics. You see the Earth, Venus as one peak on the histogram. Okay. Mars is too, but it has a, because it has a big, probably there has been a huge impact uh, at the top of Mars, but uh, it's a different history. Two important concepts I want to discuss. First, something that uh, all the chemists and uh, maybe biochemists are really familiar with is the concept of alkalinity. Alkalinity drives the world. Al what is alkalinity here? The number of charges here. You have a cations, 
and anions in the ocean. Okay, sodium, chlorine, most of it, potassium, magnesium, calcium here, and we have anions, and there is a deficit. This deficit is controlled by, is actually filled by carbonates. HC, um, hydrogen carbonate plus carbonates. This black stuff is called alkalinity, HCO3 plus 2CO3. Today we have a flux of, this property is conservative. It means that you can, you can actually, if you have a two, two liters of, uh, of uh, seawater with a particular amount of alkalinity, you combine them together and you're going to get twice as much. Okay? You cannot change it. You can change the pH, you can change the pCO2, you can change all the things, but alkalinity doesn't change. How is alkalinity? What is strange element? So you can, can either consider alkalinity as HCO3 plus 2CO3 2 minus, uh, this guy doesn't really count in most cases here, or you can also say it's a deficit between, it's the excess of cations over, over uh, anions. The second thing is that what does water above the surf, the sur uh, above the sea level does? Here, that's what we have today. It rains. CO2 and H2O react with crust, bring a number of interesting things like alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, carbonates. They will bring, we'll see, strontium-85 excess, and they will bring nutrients. Think of a word this way here. It doesn't rain on continents because continents are under sea level. So in order to control the CO2 here, we have to get some material reacting with the oceanic crust. And this is not easy. It's not a very efficient process. I can tell you when it rains, like we saw it here, you have this really good control of alkalinity, a really good control of pH when you are under seawater. The fluxes in the, in, the, in the oceanic crust are not that great after all, except in some places like uh, island arcs and places like this. But we have a different things here. Before 2.7 giga years, this the transition year was at about 2.7, 2.4 giga years. And that makes a huge difference in control. Okay, what the source? The source of alkalinity. You react here. This is a clinopyroxene reacting with water and CO2, and produces carbonates or produce, uh, producing magnesium here. You can see. Uh, well, the calcium has disappeared somewhere, but it doesn't matter. Uh, calcium has disappeared here. So you can uh, count alkalinity either as magnesium or as uh, bicarbonates, here, uh, hydrogen or carbonates here. The ocean, the, the atmosphere was very different. The atmosphere had no, uh, I'm sure that Karim will mention that, before 2.4 billion years, we had a very different atmosphere with no oxygen. How can we tell? We tell from the excess of sulfide uh, 33, which is actually the evidence of photo oxygen photolysis because of the ozone layer. The ozone layer, this is something, are you going to talk about this? I will talk about the yeah. yeah. You have a, you have the sun uh, uh, photons here. If uh, there is an ozone layer, they stopped. This is what we have today. In the past, we didn't have ozone layer because we didn't have oxygen. So all the UVs were reacting with SO2, and there was a photolysis. It's a non, it's a mass independent process, what we call a MIF, mass independent fractionation process. And you can tell here that something great happened, which is the great oxidation event. I know that some people among you are working on this thing. Okay? So the atmosphere was different. So this is what I explained. Uh, maybe the, the GOE, what's it called, the great oxidation event, this is what happened. You have a difference here. You move from this state here to the state there, okay? And that you have a flux. Today, to give you an idea, the residence time of alkalinity in the ocean is 100,000 years. That should ring you a bell because it's a cycle with the glacial, interglacial things. It, is, it resonates with other things. But alkalinity is renewed every 100,000 years. 
Okay, water from the ocean is renewed every 30,000 years, alkalinity is renewed every 100,000 years. You wonder how fast alkalinity was renewed in a world like this, probably a much longer time. And you can see it, you can also see it with uh, str uh, strontium isotopes. You know, the way of measuring strontium-87 is produced by the radioactive decay of rubidium-87. Uh, precipitate limestones. Limestones has a lot of calcium, a lot of uh, strontium and no rubidium. So essentially the limestone gives you a record of the strontium isotopes at the time the carbonate formed. And so you know whether you have a strontium coming from the continent with a high 87-86 ratio or comes from the oceanic crust with a low 87-86 ratio. You know where the continents will emerge. This is a great contribution by Nicola Flamand, Nicola Coltis. We see the same kind of things with zinc, zinc isotopes. We see a transition. This is difficult. This is strontium here. Uh, you see this here. But you see also a transition at 2.4, which you can relate to. OK, let me see. So I want to ask the question now. Uh, are hydrothermal vents a good place to start life? And uh, here you have a different uh, redox systems here. This is, uh, this is food, and this is uh, oxidation here, okay? You have a CH4, you have a carbonate here, you have H2S, you have a sulfate, okay? You have uh, electron acceptors and electron donors here, okay? And you must have a starter somewhere. Is that a good place to start? The answer is certainly not, okay? It's not a good place to start, and I'm going to show you why. You can, of course, produce that kind of energy, H2 here, you think, uh, uh, Karim may mention that tonight. You see this uh, H2 being produced and being oxidized and uh, producing methane and producing ammonia. You can do a lot of goodies with uh, hydrogen. It's very easy. It's very cheap. There is a lot of it and you can do it. Okay, and this is Isua one more time with serpentine here, ultramafic rocks and talc schist and whatever. This is the same thing here. You have a serpentinized or chloritized olivine here. You have a carbonate, the same, same kind of things. But we know one thing, and uh, Hervé showed it earlier today, is that life relies on continent. This is, a, this is modern pr primary production. The amount of carbon produced per square meter per year okay, is related to continents. Why? Because of phosphorus. We need nutrients. If you eat all the phosphorus, you know, like when you were a kid, you were eating all the cookies in the fridge and you would leave the empty, uh, the empty box, okay? But that's the same thing. If you put life in a place where there is phosphate and nobody to brings, like mom, back phosphate into the fridge, you're going to die. That's the same thing here. So you have, uh, you have here upwellings here, upwelling here, here, here. You have all these upwelling which is here, with this huge productivity here. And you can see it when you correlate nutrients like a nitrate and phosphate here. You can see surface water are depleted in nutrients like the fridge after you've eaten all the, all the cookies and the deep water here, which are still contain a lot of cookies. Okay, and phosphate is indispensable because it's uh, okay. You see the same thing in the oxygen utilization nutrient consumption. You see phosphate being depleted here in green, silicate being depleted here, and at the same time oxygen being depleted. So you see that you're actually using nutrients to produce life. You don't need to have a material, you need to have a dynamics to make life. You have to, you have to make a sustainable, even if it was four billion years ago, it had to be sustainable. Something like a Ganymede or Europe is not sustainable, okay, because you don't have a continent. So this is the water words that we were talking about, Europe and Ganymede, and uh, I'm going to skip. Why is it important? Yeah. Why? You need, to, you need to have these things, phosphate, what, what do you need it for? For energy and for pumps, for biological pumps. You need a hydrogen pump to control the pH of your cell and the HCO3. 
and you need uh, the, something which is going to regulate osmosis. So you need the sodium potassium pumps. What is the sodium potassium pump? So you have them here. So the yellow guy is uh, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And you have uh, sodium in red and potassium in blue. So you exchange three sodium for two potassium or vice versa. You have uh, three things here. You're going to get these three sodium going into here and two potassium going into there. So you're going to balance one charge. This is how animals and vegetables and everything reacts to uh, maintain osmotic pressure. So if you change the osmotic pressure against the environment, you need to balance protons this way. So uh, it's important because if you compare the ancient ocean and two things, the cytosol of a cell serum from humans and seawater here, you can see the potassium sodium in seawater today is heavily balanced towards sodium. But in the serum, in the cytosol, you have a potassium which is much higher than sodium. Wow, that should tell you something about the origin of the ocean. There must have been a lot of potassium in the ancient ocean. Because you needed that, okay? You need all this potassium, which is not in the ocean today. So what are actually the, co the chemical controls of the ocean? Today, most of the control of the ocean is that we're bringing carbonate alkalinity. We bring alkalinity from the continents and we dispose of alkalinity by carbonates. We didn't have that in the past. There was no carbonate. This is H. This is the volume of sediments. Look at dolomite. Look at limestone 3.5 billion years ago. There was no carbonate to be seen. So the balance of alkalinity was totally different in the past from what it is today. So we have uh, two ways of uh, making alkalinity by, uh, by weathering silicates, this is olivine here, or by recycling ancient alkalinity like calcium carbonate. Existing calcium carbonate today is okay here. And that helps you buffer the pH. You want to buffer the pH, why? Otherwise your amino acids don't work. Amino acids, they have a first pK at 3 and they have the second pK at 8, 9. So if you let the pH drift, you're dead. And the amino acid won't do their job. So you have a pCO2. See if the pCO2 is condensed. This is a, you know this uh, Anderson Hasselbeck uh, equation here. The pH is controlled by buffers. This is the buffer, carbonate buffer. You're either very high, like a today. And then today we in equilibrium pCO2 constant. No, like it, like a, uh, yeah, this H2CO3 is constant here. We have a carbonate which is up. If we are at a, at a high pH here, pK is 10.3. Uh, uh, what is a balance is carbonate saturation from here, so CO3 is constant here, and uh, HCO3 plays in the other direction. So you have this uh, sweet balance between the two uh, dissociation constant of carbonates that you need to maintain with erosion. And that you do it with by adding alkalinity. And the alkalinity on Mars, the alkalinity on the ancient ocean, was somewhere around here with a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. Today we're rather here. We have a carbonates. We have a, we have a, because we have the CO3, CO3 2 constant and then we can maintain life because we have the right pH and our amino acids are happy as clams. Okay. You know. Can we do that? What's the effect? Someone asked the, the question about temperature, PCO2 chlorine content here. Let me remind you something, water boils and it boils at different pressure. The temperature 200, 300, 400, 500, this is depth in the ocean. Here if you are at 3000 meters, temperature is 400 degrees. It's good for soup, it's not good for life. If you are in some other places like ocean, uh, ocean islands or island arcs, you might be at 150 degrees. 
and the pH will be high. Why is the pH like this? You see, the high temperature water rock interaction produces a low pH solutions. Can you see this reaction here? Pyroxene plus H plus done calcium plus magnesium plus silica. Okay, the more you the, the more you increase the temperature, the more H plus you produce. If you produce H plus at high temperature, you kill the bugs. If you want to keep the bugs alive, you have to keep the pH low. You have to keep the pH low. You have to, take, to keep the temperature low. At the pH high, you must keep the temperature low. You cannot make easily life spring out at mid-ocean region because it's too hot, it's too acid. So we have a, a, so we have a hot and deep, and in addition to this, the potassium-sodium ratio changes, okay? Towards a high temperature, you have a very high potassium and very low sodium. So you have a different ocean no sulfate, high sodium, you have all kinds of things. Even chlorine is a mess. Okay, this is a, 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 a Fourier. Okay, let me see, I'm, I'm almost finished with this. Uh, okay, well, for instance, okay, you, uh, this is a granite. Okay, deposition of kefir spar from cooling hydrothermal solution. When you cool, there's too much potassium all of a sudden, potassium precipitates. Chlorine is another thing. Chlorine is produced by volcanoes. And there is no when you when you increase when you increase the amount of chlorine in solution, chlorine, what is the effect of chlorine? Charge balance, Cl minus. You need to balance potassium, sodium, calcium, and everything. So more chlorine you produce, the more H plus the more sodium, the more calcium, the more. So the pH increases here when chlorine increases. So we have to take all these uh, things uh, we to consider whether this kind of environment is good. All black smokers are a favorable site for the emergence of light. Not really, because temperature is too high, the pH is too low, and we have no operation of amino acid. And uh, we have also have the problem of phosphate renewal that uh, Hervé mentioned. And if I use another kind of environment, which is island arc, well, okay, here you have something which is the Marianas. You see all these low temperature, high pH vents. And then you yeah, good temperature, uh, good pH. And if you do it in the early days, with uh, not too much chlorine because uh, chlorine, which has a very long residence time in the ocean, has a hard time to expand in the whole ocean. You can, you can be in business with creating life. So we need plate tectonics, we need shallow environments, we need low temperature, and then we can do something. But that has nothing to do with the modern environment of mid-ocean ridges. Okay. So this is what I have here, 350 degrees, 3000 meter, pH of 3.5. Here you have a phosphorus coming from island arc, so you can reduce, uh, you can increase the nutrients, 800 meters, 100, and a pH of 8. Okay, thank you. Thank you.